Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on a new book by MIT professor Christopher Capazola, Bound by War, How the United States and the Philippines Build America's First Pacific Century. Dr. Capazola, congratulations on the book and welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We're also very fortunate to have with us Professor Cindy Yifan Cheng, who will provide initial comments and begin this afternoon's discussion that we hope will involve many of you in the audience as well. A warm welcome to you as well, Professor Cheng. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege, as on most Monday afternoons, to co-chair this seminar series with Professor Eric Arneson of George Washington University. Eric is an alum of the Wilson Center and also serves as director of the National History Center. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. For more than a decade now, this seminar series has tried to provide a forum, a nonpartisan forum in the nation's capital to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications that shed new light on policy relevant issues in national and global affairs. Prior to the pandemic, we met on a weekly basis at the Wilson Center, but we're now very pleased to come to you via Zoom and Facebook Live. And we're delighted that many more people have been able to participate in these sessions. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who helped produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the National History Center and Peter Bierstecker on the History and Public Policy Programs staff. Our thanks to both of them. We also would like to acknowledge our supporters. We'd like to thank our two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History in the Public Interest at Villanova University and George Washington University's History Department. We also welcome your support. Feel free to uh, uh, do donate to support the seminar. Details on how to do so will be posted in the chat function now. A couple of preliminaries on the, um, on the format. Um, our session today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations' websites. For the Q&A part of this webinar, you have three options. You can use the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality, and you can start doing so now and get into the queue. Once you press the button, you will enter into the queue and the moderate, once the moderator calls on you, you will receive a prompt that will ask you to unmute yourself. Please do so, and then you um, can talk. Please introduce yourself to the panelists. You can also you, uh, post your question in the Q&A function in the Zoom functionality, uh, but we prefer being in conversation with you. So use the raise hand function if you, um, if you can. If you're following us on Facebook Live, please submit your questions to Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. And with that, I'll turn the Zoom room over to Eric. Eric, the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you, Christian. I'm very glad to be here this afternoon, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, first our uh, featured speaker, Christopher Capazola, who is a professor of history at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he teaches classes on political and legal history, on war and the military, and the history of immigration. He is the author of Uncle Sam Wants You, World War I and the Making of the of Modern American Citizen, published in 2008, a book I, uh, I'm happy to report uh, I reviewed when it first came out and I just had the pleasure of teaching uh, in my graduate seminar uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, he is also the author of the book we're gonna be talking about today, Bound by War, How the United States and the Philippines Built America's First Pacific Century. He is co-curator of the Volunteers, Americans Join World War I, an historical exhibition commemorating the centennial of the First World War and an academic advisor uh, for the Filipino Veterans Recognition and Education Project. Uh, in 2018, he was named Mick Vicker Faculty Fellow, MIT's highest honor for undergraduate teaching. Christopher, Zoom Room is yours. 
All right, um, thank you very much. Um, thanks uh, to Professor Arneson for that, um, that generous introduction. Thank you uh, to Christian Osterman uh, for organizing. Um, thank you also to Rachel Wheatley and Peter Bierstecker for uh, organizing this through the National History Center and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, and uh, thanks in advance to Professor Chang for, uh, for taking the time to respond and comment. And I think also just a special thanks to everyone for making the space for thinking um, at this moment about the history of Asians and Asian Americans in the United States um, at a challenging time um, that, that calls on us to sort of look at this history in, in broader perspective and, and bring that to bear. Um, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes this afternoon about um, 25 to 30 minutes about the book that I just published, Bound by War, uh, How the United States and the Philippines Built America's First Pacific Century. Um, I'm not actually going to show PowerPoint slides because I find that on Zoom, when you do that, the PowerPoint is too small and the speaker's face gets really, really small as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually share in the chat um, links to three digital projects, uh, digital history projects that I've worked on um, over the years um, that are both a digital exhibition, um, some online teaching materials that I hope will sort of have a better sort of visual account than anything I would be able to put on the screen. Um, so I'll do that. I can do that in the chat. Um, and I think I can do that right now. Um, and, and I don't know if it'll go to everyone. Um, but what I think I can also do um, is uh, share with, uh, with you afterward and post it on a slide at the very end of this for those who are watching on Facebook or YouTube later. Um, so let me dive in. Um, I will begin where the book does, um, in Manila, at the Manila American Cemetery, which is located on 152 acres, just a few miles outside the Philippine capital of Manila. Um, the cemetery memorializes more than 36,000 soldiers and sailors who died or went missing, um, who fought under the, flag, the American flag during the Pacific War. To enter the Manila American Cemetery um, is to leave the noise and pace of 21st century Manila. Its spacious grounds, uh, its landscaped uh, sort of uh, lands offer the city's freshest air and its greenest grass. Um, it is a hilltop uh, that is the former site of the US Army's Fort McKinley, uh, the command post from which the United States governed uh, the Philippine colony. But today the cemetery and its central memorial command remarkable views of the skyscrapers and apartment buildings of a booming Asian metropolis, um, of rolling hills to the east and of sunsets over uh, Manila Bay. Uh, and as a memorial to the sacrifices of war, it is quite a remarkable place. Um, it is also, uh, on many days, remarkably empty. Um, the first time I visited, I was, according to the guest book, one of the only Americans there. And even in Manila, it is easy to overlook this place. Neighboring Fort McKinley is gone, um, closed uh, after World War II and turned over in 1949 to the armed forces of the Philippines, um, and more recently replaced in part by an upscale shopping center known simply as the Fort. Um, but nevertheless, on that quiet uh, sort of Manila hilltop, the names of the Pacific War Dead tell the history of a shared story of two nations bound by a century of war. As the memorial attests, the US military has been in the Philippines for a long time, starting in 1898, when the United States conquered the Spanish colony and an annexed it to the United States. And then in the years from 1898 to 1946, when it was a US colony, and in the decades since independence, when the Philippines has been a US ally in Asia. Now, part of what I want to trace in this book is that Filipinos have been in the US armed forces for just as long. Beginning in 1899 and continuing to this day, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos and Filipino Americans have served under the American flag. The first were the Philippine scouts, recruited into Uncle Sam's service by army officers eager to de defeat the Filipino independence struggle, a war that they dismissed as the Philippine insurrection. By the 1920s, in fact, Philippine scouts outnumbered US soldiers in the territory. In the years between the two world wars, thousands of Filipinos joined the US Navy, nearly all of them restricted to bottom rung positions as cooks or stewards. The Second World War, which is the, in some ways the heart of the book, um, it called up hundreds of thousands more. In the continental United States, about 7,000 Filipino migrants uh, joined the US Army's first and second Filipino regiments. More than 120,000 served in the ranks of the doomed Philippine Army 
that met the invading Japanese forces in 1942. At least 70,000 men and women, probably more, fought in guerrilla movements that battled the Japanese occupation. One telling statistic, some 67,000 of the 76,000 prisoners on the Bataan Death March were Filipinos who served under the American flag, many of whom waited until 2009 to receive equitable citizenship and veteran benefits from the United States government. That story um, is, is something that I'm seeking to tell in, in this book. Equally overlooked, however, are the Philippine chapters of names more familiar in US history as careers advanced in the Philippines led to Washington's corridors of power, whether for William Howard Taft or Dwight Eisenhower, Paul Wolfowitz or Paul Manafort. What were they doing in the Philippines and what were Filipinos doing in the US armed forces? Bound by War begins with those questions. Answering them requires the history of the soldiers and sailors who crossed the Pacific and of the two nations bound together by the wars that they fought together. So the book has three main aims and arguments that I tried to accomplish. First, it seeks to restore this history um, and document um, that the United States maintained a colonial army for most of the 20th century much as other empires in the world did throughout the 20th century. Second, uh, it aims to view US history from the Pacific, showing that the United States has always been a Pacific power, that we have already had a Pacific century, uh, and that that Pacific century was not just a rhetorical strategy um, of US foreign policy, but a lived experience shaped um, by histories of migration, work, culture, and family life. And third, it encourages us to think in new ways about the US military as a central institution in 20th century American life. Not only, of course, as a fighting force, but also as a generative institution that has transformed social relationships, immigration patterns, uh, ideas about race, culture, and citizenship. So those three things are traced in a history of the United States and the Philippines that doesn't end when, when formal colonial occupation ended in 1946, in part because Filipino military service didn't end then either. The Philippines shifted from colony to ally, Japan from enemy to friend. The Cold War soon burned hot in Korea and Vietnam and the Republic of the Philippines sent armed contingents to both of those conflicts. And war in Asia meant that even with independence, uh, the two nations and their armed forces would continue to serve together. In 1947, a bilateral agreement between the two countries guaranteed the United States access to 23 military bases in the new nation at the same time that it authorized the enlistment of up to 2,000 Philippine citizens a year in the US Navy, a policy that ended only in 1992. Um, of course, in the 1960s, planes landed at Clark Air Base, um, a, a military facility four times the size of the District of Columbia. American sailors arrived at Subic Bay Naval Station from Vietnam for uh, R&R. &R. A generation later, Operation Enduring Freedom undertook military action not only in Afghanistan, um, but around the world, including the Southern Philippines as well, its largest non-Afghani uh, sort of troop commitment. Um, in, and as the United States began its war in Iraq in 2003, about 31,000 non-citizens wore the uniforms of the US Armed Forces. 20% of those were Filipinos, more than from any other country in the world. And of course, uh, this is not just a story of the soldiers and sailors themselves, but the people around them. Um, throughout it all, countless others, Filipinos and Filipino Americans who never wore a uniform were affected by the service of those who did. All the people who worked for or near the US military, civilian farmers and factory workers who produced food, weapons, and airplanes, spouses who kept uh, families going during sailors' long absences at sea, young protesters demanding equal treatment for aging veterans. Now, for most of the 20th century, US uh, military service offered the clearest path to migration and US citizenship for those Filipinos who wanted it. Uh, and it's not too hard to trace this, the, or to see the traces of this on the landscape, because some of the communities in the United States with the oldest or even the largest number of Filipino settlers also happen to be U.S. Navy towns. Vallejo, California, near Mare Island, National City, near Naval Station San Diego, 
Norfolk and Virginia Beach near Hampton Roads. In 2021, the United States counts some 4 million Filipino Americans, one of the nation's fastest growing ethnic groups. Many trace their family's histories to a father or an uncle in a US military uniform. Uh, and when they don't, someone else's father or uncle casts a shadow. Military service has provided Filipinos, as it has for many other immigrant groups in American history, a language of patriotism and sacrifice, um, and therefore of a demand for equality. Immigrants and their cho children used these words, not only to wage a decades long struggle uh, for equity for World War II veterans, but to find a place for themselves in America, making their service part of America's military history, making their protests and lawsuits part of its civil rights legacy, handing down mindsets and memories of war and the military from one generation to the next. Now, for me, a broken promise stands at the heart of this history. The 1946 Rescission Act, which retroactively stripped some 200,000 Filipino soldiers of US naturalization rights and ultimately veterans benefits. Um, and I'm going to tell the story of the passage of that bill um, in the second part of this talk. Over the course of the six decades that followed the passage of the Rescission Act, veterans and their advocates challenged the, the law with courtroom challenges, petitions to government agencies, public protests, and legislative initiatives. And I want to sort of trace the history of this law, which I think is one of the most important laws that you've probably never heard of. Uh, because it shows us the promises that were made to Filipino veterans and how those promises were broken uh, and how those veterans and their advocates and allies um, demanded that the United States fulfill its broken promise. Now, just to back up uh, to the Second World War, uh, Filipinos who served the, under the American flag during the Second World War earned citizenship rights and veterans benefits that were promised to them in both law, um, including the Nationality Act of 1940, executive orders, including a July 1941 executive order by President Franklin Roosevelt incorporating the Philippine Army into uh, the US Army forces in the Far East, um, and by battlefield commands by General Douglas MacArthur, sort of uh, uh, making clear statements about the place of guerrilla forces in uh, US Army forces um, after the reinvasion in 1944. And after the war, um, soldiers discovered um, the Nationality Act of 1940 and a 1942 amendment to it that promised non-citizen soldiers rapid naturalization if they could file their citizenship paperwork by December 31st, 1946. Now, around the world, uh, in the entire US Armed Forces, about 140,000 non-citizen soldiers from dozens of countries filed this paperwork and earned US citizenship this way including some small number of Filipinos who were serving in the US Army in other theaters of war besides the Pacific. A very few were naturalized in the Philippines itself. On August 1st, 1945, in the very last days of the war, the US government authorized the vice consul in Manila to carry out these naturalizations, right? sort of granting this authority specifically to the INS. But that authority, um, and its implications for immigration rates soon came under scrutiny. Now, lawyers, historians, um, and others for decades have been scrounging the archives for the evidence that will prove this. Um, they didn't turn it up then, and I didn't turn it up in my own research, uh, but it appears to be the case um, through secondhand testimonial evidence that officials in both the United States and the colonial government of the Philippines appear to have agreed that mass naturalization would lead to large scale emigration of Filipino veterans to the United States at the war's end in 1945. And we know for sure that this was a result that neither the, the US government nor the Philippine colonial government re, uh, really looked forward to. As Attorney General Tom Clark said at the time, quote, it would be a political embarrassment and a drain of manpower to have a mass exodus of young Filipino ex-fighting men and women going to the United States on the eve of independence of the new nation. And so uh, the, soon there was a solution worthy of Catch-22, uh, the Second World War's most memorable novel of military bureaucracy. On September 13th, 1945, just days after Japanese officers surrendered to the US aboard the USS Missouri, the US Commissioner of Immigration, 
wrote to Attorney General Tom Clark asking that the quote, naturalization situation be handled by revoking the authority previously granted to the vice consul and omitting to designate anyone else in place. So the authority existed, but there was no officer who could carry it out. Clark approved the maneuver. By the end of October, nearly 200,000 soldiers who had marched under the American flag and had a legal right to claim US citizenship had no one before whom they could file their claim. Only in August 1946, after formal Philippine independence, did the INS return. And during a brief window between August and December 1946, there was a naturalization office that operated in Manila, which filed some 4,000 applications out of some 200,000 who were eligible. So these maneuvers foreclosed large-scale naturalization and mass migrations, but also denied basic rights to Filipino soldiers who had marched next to American soldiers at Bataan. This was not America's finest hour. Then came a second broken promise. Filipino veterans were going to be expensive um, if they were eligible for full US benefits with a lifetime benefit cost of 190,000 veterans estimated to run as high as $3.2 billion. So Arizona Senator Carl Hayden uh, together with Senator Richard Russell of Georgia and Charles Brooks of Illinois, drafted what would become known as the Rescission Act, which included a provision inserted by the Senate Appropriations Committee following an off the record debate, stating that quote, wartime service in the organized military forces of the Philippines shall not be deemed to have been service in the forces of the United States for the purpose of any law conferring rights, privileges, or benefits. In plain English, Filipino soldiers were not American soldiers, at least when it came time to pay their benefits. The law thus blocked individual claims by Filipino veterans from the Philippine army or the guerrillas. No GI bill, no college loan, no home mortgage, no medical care, no widow's stipend, not even a flag for the soldier's casket. This was not America's finest hour either. Now, President Harry Truman very much wanted to veto the bill, but mindful of the pressures of a belt tightening post-war Congress, cognizant of the desperate financial plight of the Philippine military, and aware of what he called the, quote, practical difficulties in making payments, he signed the Rescission Act on February 18th, 1946. Appending a signing statement, Truman insisted that there nevertheless existed, quote, a moral obligation of the United States to look after the welfare of Philippine army veterans. Truman meanwhile assured, quote, our comrades in the Philippines that the issue is receiving attention and is being expedited as much as possible, uh, becoming the first of literally a dozen presidents to promise action on the Filipino veterans issue at some other future date. For Filipino veterans, the Rescission Act was thus both a broken promise and would long remain unfinished business. Now, in the second half of the book, I trace sort of how this, how the Rescission Act was undone um, in the 63 years uh, between its passage in 1946 um, and the payment of equity, uh, Filipino veterans equity after 2009, while also telling the history of Filipinos in Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq. Um, uh, and I, I sort of look in particular at sort of the story of veterans and their advocates, uh, because I think this is a story that comprises the crucial chapter of America's civil rights heritage as well as its history of, of immigration. By the late 1980s, um, an upsurge in organized political efforts focused primarily on the US Congress sought to gain full equity for Filipino veterans. And I trace this to five key shifts that explain why veterans were able to win in the late 20th century when they could not in 1946. First, 1986 brought the fall of the Ferdinand Marcos regime. And with this disappeared the close ties uh, that Marcos had formed with World War II veterans organizations. And thus supporting the veterans no longer implicitly allied one with the Marcos uh, administration. In fact, in an unexpected way, the veterans issue helped bracket political controversy and was one of the one sort of, of the few issues around which everyone could agree. Second, the end of the Cold War in 1989 and the closure of US military bases in the Philippines after 1991 brought about a drastic decrease in US foreign aid budgets 
Um, and for decades, that was the tactic that Philippine politicians had pursued to win funds for veterans. Now, supporters of the veterans understood that the Cold War language of aid or alliance would yield few results. Third, Filipino Americans began to organize in social movements in the years after the 1960s. Activism re reflected the civil rights movements of the country at large, as well as the ethnic revival of the 1970s. Um, it emerged in communities around the nation. It was most visible in California, where Filipino American workers joined UFW grape strikes, where students participated in student strikes at San Francisco State College in 1968, the long battle between 1968 and 1981 to stop the destruction of San Francisco's International Hotel, a Chinatown rooming house that served low-income aging Filipino citizen city residents, among others. All of this galvanized a citywide multi-ethnic activist collective. And the emergence of an explicitly pan-ethnic Asian American movement brought visibility, allies, and new agendas. Um, but uh, it had to move from the streets to Congress. Right? And the fourth shift thing that shifts um, is, uh, is transformations in political power, particularly um, with demographic expansion. In the wake of the Immigration Act of 1965, Filipino populations in the US continued to increase reaching almost 2 million by the late 1980s and about 4 million uh, by, the 20, by 2020. Asian Americans increasingly found representative voices in Congress, long serving figures such as Hawaii Senator Daniel Inouye and Daniel Akaka gained seniority, Representative Norman Mineta from the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus in 1994, and representatives with large Asian American constituencies, such as Rob Filner of San Diego, paid increasing attention to veterans and their concerns particularly as more migrants naturalized and registered to vote as US citizens. And then fifth um, is in the 1980s and 90s, American political culture embraced the greatest generation um, as the metaphor uh, sine qua non for heroic American citizenship, while at the same time paying much closer attention to the wartime contributions of people of color. Hollywood movies um, co uh, coincided with controversies over monuments and museums, but what really interests me is the legislation around veterans issues that poured out of subcommittees over the space of the 1990s. Um, something that appeared all the more urgent with the shrinking population of the veterans as they aged. And this opened space for veterans and their advocates um, in new ways. First in November, 1990, um, the confluence of these forces led to a provision in the Immigration and Naturalization Act that granted most Filipino veterans a two year window of opportunity for naturalization. Right, for citizenship. Supporters repeated General Douglas MacArthur's uh, wartime insistence on, quote, equal pay for equal risk, and argued that, quote, American veterans should get American benefits. Of about 70,000 eligible veterans, 28,000 were naturalized by 1998, and of those, about 17,000 migrated to the United States. But the 1990 law only affects citizenship. The question of benefits remained. And year after year, in the 90s and 2000s, advocates on Capitol Hill repeatedly introduced legislation and the VA in fact endorsed it uh, from the sidelines, but time again it stalled as long-standing assumptions about the foreignness of Filipino soldiers or, the, or concerns about the costs of granting full equity persisted. In late 2008, North Carolina Senator Richard Burr objected to quote, aid for foreigners, otherwise known as veterans benefits for soldiers under the American flag and warned that equity legislation would, quote, take money away from veterans in this country, even though most of the veterans lived in this country. January 2009, however, brought a new constellation of forces, right? Along with the worst economic crisis in, uh, since the Great Depression came the 111th Congress, which placed Senator Daniel Inouye in the chair seat of the Senate Committee on Appropriations, Senator Daniel Akaka in charge of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, and across the Capitol, San Diego's representative Bob Filner at the head of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, right? So something that had been on the table for a long time was now in the hands of people who wielded power. Together, they succeeded in folding a proposed legislation for Filipino veterans into the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the stimulus. So you may not have read this particular passage of, of the 2009 bill, 
right? Uh, but the Recovery Act included an authorization of $198 million for a Filipino Veterans Equity Fund, which would pay a $15,000 one-time lump sum payment to eligible veterans and, uh, if with US citizenship and $9,000 to veterans who were Philippine citizens in, in the Philippines. Um, symbolically, but importantly, the act overturned the spirit, if not the letter of the Rescission Act by designated ser designating service in the wartime Philippines as quote, active service uh, for the purpose of VA and other federal benefits. Uh, but of course, uh, this was at the, on the one hand, this was a moment of, of great celebration um, and, and there was a great deal of sort of uh, a sense of victory around it, but also a sense that it was too little and too late that by the time we get to 2009, there were somewhere between 15 and 18,000 um, surviving uh, Filipino World War II veterans. The passage of time, the challenge of documenting guerrilla service nearly seven de decades after the fact, meant that in the end, the VA re released payments for only about 12 to 13,000 of the surviving uh, veterans. Now, this achievement came with flourishes of nostalgia and back patting patriotism. Representative Michael Honda, the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, boasted that, quote, after a decades long struggle, Filipino World War II veterans have finally received the recognition and compensation they deserve for their brave service to the US during World War II. It had all the markings of a happy ending, and on some level, it was but perhaps Lillian Galeto, the co-chair of the National Alliance for Filipino Veterans Equity, was more right than she realized when she described the stimulus as, quote, yet another beginning. Now, the Filipino World War II veterans will soon fade into history, uh, but the political struggles that they embodied, both in the United States and in the Philippines, and the enduring bonds that they established and created between the United States and the Philippines are sure to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Our discussant today is Cindy Yifen Chang, who is professor of history and director of the Asian American Studies program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she teaches courses on race, gender, class, sexuality, and nationality structures, as well as on Cold War culture, transnationality, and Asian American history and culture. She's the author of Citizens of Asian America, Democracy and Race During the Cold War, published by New York University Press in 2013, a book that received the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature in Adult Nonfiction. She is the editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Asian American Studies, which appeared in 2016, and her articles have appeared in, among other places, American Quarterly and the Journal of Asian American Studies. Cindy, we're delighted you're here. The Zoom room is yours. Thank you so much. I just want to have quick clarification. I ended my directorship last fall. So yay, <laughs> just in case. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I would like to begin by thanking the two co-chairs of the Washington History Seminar, the George Washington University Professor Eric Arneson and Dr. Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center for coordinating this event. Um, thank you to Rachel Wheatley for setting up this virtual session and really to all of you for attending. I know Zoom sessions are not easy. Um, finally, I want to say a real, you know, heartfelt thanks to Professor Christopher Capozilla for writing this wonderful book and providing us this occasion to convene and discuss. Um, and I promise to keep my comments brief so that we could have hopefully some great conversations together and interactions. Um, Indigenous studies scholar, Dr. Keo, <laughs> Keolani um, Kawanui reminds us that colonization is a structure, not an event. Or in other words, it's a process and not an ontology. And one of the crowning achievements of Dr. Capazola's work is his masterful retelling of the 48 years of US colonization of the Philippines as a process and the neocolonial status of the Philippines in relation to the US as courses of action. And to write this type of history, Kabazala did not treat US colonization as an overdetermined force. Rather, he takes seriously his transnational approach in examining US Philippine relations. In this task of then of developing the exchange of goods, people, and ideas within this context of power, um, Filipinos did not just factor into this narrative as agents of dissents, actors of insurrections, 
Rather, what makes his work so important is how Capazzolo shows how Filipinos also made colonization possible. Um, though their stakes and reasons for their American support may differ from um, US, you know, the US side. And here power becomes a hegemony, right? And involves coercion and consent. Um, what then becomes really nuanced about this retelling of the US colonial relations isn't just a focus on the Spanish American war, but I really appreciated the very careful attention to the Philippine American war and the subsequent insurrection movements that you did and all the different various characters. And also the, all those people who served in, as you say, the various colonial armies from the constabulary, the Filipino National Guards and as stewards of, um, of the, the Navy. In, in short, right, in the story, Filipinos factored as both agents of independence, right? And as, um, as you noted, veterans of the um, colonial army. And here, I think you gave us such a great thing of what you have called power and partnership. Um, another pathbreaking aspect of this book is um, your development of colonization, right? Of empire making it wasn't actually just through the military, although you know you focus. It is a lot. It was also through immigration, right? That um, you focus so much of the book on uh, Filipinos in the United States and how they were building up the empire of the United States, both as settler colonialists in Hawaii and as chief workers. Um, in the agricultural industry and seasonal workers of various Pacific states in the United States. And so taken together, right, I think many people here would say that your work is an, a, an incredible example, right, of how diplomatic history could be broadened, right? It's not just high treaties and different policies, but you looked at immigration, citizenship, naturalization laws, right? as diplomatic tools. And it's not just about diplomats and generals and these figures, you looked at stewards and farm workers, right? And so that's diplomatic history can be social history. And so it was such an amazing thing to read a book that did all these things. I actually have two main, two major questions and they're big ones, okay? And they kind of also, um, I enveloped them into comments and so and so forth. So. Um, and I, I did, I think the first one, I'm asking you a big question, okay? All right, so of course I'm gonna, I wanna return in this kind of question comment section, right? To probably one of the most intriguing aspects of your book, which is the framing or the historicization of US colonial and neocolonial relations with, the, you know, with Philippines as America's first Pacific century, right? And my first question then, even after, you know, I'm gonna, unpack every, why I'm asking this question. <laughs> but the short and uh, short part of it is to ask you to ex to give you a chance to expand on what you think are the continuities of what you are looking at to what you described also in Yintra as the 2011 notion of, you know, Clinton's notion of the Amer America specific century, right? I think I asked this because um, I wonder, I still do wonder if disjunctures are in fact more prominent than continuities, right? And my framework for asking this question is pretty straightforward, okay? Um, often the building of the American century people do look to, right, the early Cold War years, right, where there was a major shift in US foreign policy towards East and Southeast Asia. As you note in your book, Philippines definitely factored into that story as well. And um, it was kind of dubbing of like, you know, where the United States became, you know, the major superpower. And currently scholars, you know, looking forward at the 21st century have dubbed it, you know, the Asian century, Pacific century, Asian Pacific century. There's many uh, monikers um, to recognize in many ways, countries like China or India or various Southeast Asian countries, you know, now taking over the economic dominance, right? Of this century, you know, as the kind of new superpower. The way I read Clinton's 2011, in some ways, appropriation of that, you know, term, as problematic of as any of those terms are, right? Of a, you know, calling America's Pacific century. I wonder if it's it's no longer just a the projection of American power because you described America's first as a projection of American power. In fact. It seems that the 2011 iteration of America's Pacific Century is in fact 
the um, kind of an, you know, an admission of the unsettling of US power. It's destabilization as a world superpower, right? Such that the policies that have, you know, subsequent, that have been of, enacted since then, right, is about wanting to break this east-west divide, right, where we are trying to uh, form ties with different east and southeast Asian countries as a way to mitigate China's dominance, right. So I wanted to, you know, ask that question, you know, that big question. And I have subsequent, like, thought questions that follow it. That's what I'm saying. It's a big one. Okay. And the first one, and I think you probably, it seems like you anticipated this question in your book, because it does come up, is where does Hawaii fit in? You talk about, and you mentioned briefly, that Hawaii and the Philippines was, if, and this was just a little thing, but I was looking for it, right? The difference between Hawaii and the Philippines was about republic versus empire. But I think indigenous scholars have taken all of us to task, right? To look at all of, you know, everything, such that the distinction between empire and republic is quite blurred these days, right? And that Hawaii right now hosts the largest Pacific fleet. So I wanted to kind of say like, where does Hawaii and Philippines, fit, you know, where does Hawaii fit into this, right? And, um, and then I'm gonna pose another geographic framework. And I was wondering how do you negotiated it? Is that many scholars of the US West right? Not so much the Turner thesis part, but a different kind of ideological meaning of frontiers would actually have framed Hawaii and the Philippines as part of the U.S. West, right? And instead of it being the Pacific, they called it the U.S. West. So I was wondering, you know, how did you negotiate the decision between what you chose, right? And the third is pretty, you know, I just had to throw it in there. You saw the uh, the shift towards the Philippines, you know, I have to also ask, like, I really didn't see much discussion in terms of where Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam fit in, right? And they're all, you know, some of them were also, they could also fit in some ways, right? Okay. And then the second big <laughs> framework that I wanted to ask is, obviously, for me, as a scholar of Asian American history, I loved, loved your section on Filipino immigrants, right? And I loved, as you said, the framework of using the Philippines as a framework, right? As opposed to the United States, such that Filipino immigrants in the United States in your work is read as transnational Filipino subjects. Loved it. Um, I did wonder, right? And you did mention in your opening remarks um, in the post World War II period, right? You looked at like some certain movements like the I Hotel, Delano Scrape Strike and all this. And some of it was about the maturation of the Filipino American community. But, and so, some of it is related to the veterans fight, not fully. I think you were trying to capture the activism of the moments, right? But my question is at what point is a third generation Filipino American a Filipino transnational subject, right? Are a person of Filipino descent, are they always forever bound by war, to use your term, right? And I was wondering because actually in the latter half, I know in your opening remarks, you talked so much about the implications of rescission, totally there. But you also gave an incredible outlining of like the continual neo-colonial relations that emerged, right? The continual use of colonial armies ongoing. And so I, I wonder to, follow through that thread, right, of how immigration still plays. I wonder if nurses and care workers, brides of US servicemen, could have played a different role in this latter half to showcase that neocolonial relations, right? And not just the veterans anymore. Um, especially since then, it allows you to talk about Filipino women. And especially since every, you know, post World War II immigration, had more Filipino women than men, that's still current, and more women are immigrating from the Philippines than men, and it all over, right? So I was wondering, um, that question was to kind of like, there could have been another cast of characters too, right? But, um, and that's all I have, but thank you again for um, your wonderful presentation and, you know, for giving me this chance to talk with you about it. Thank you very much, Cindy. Christopher, I think there are some questions that you might want to delve into, and uh, you can take a number of moments to uh, respond and engage. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, 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 Professor Chek, thank you so much um, for, for 
reading it right now, <laughs> cover to cover, um, and for all of these things. I'm not going to be able to address uh, every, every point in here. So let me just pick maybe a couple of them um, and, and talk about it. And I think um, that you, you're, uh, you're right to pick up that this is a book that is fundamentally about continuity. Um, and, you know, which is and 95 percent of American history books are or history books are about change. Right. <laughs> so when you get a book about continuity, it's not something that's you know, a little bit different. Um, and uh, but I and I see that I certainly see your point that in the broader sense, the, the claim that the 21st century is is a Pacific century, that this is America's new, suddenly new Pacific century, um, is an assertion of disjuncture. Um, and, um, and part of what I was trying to do was sort of say, you know, no, there's a continuity there. Um, but I think that that, is, that assertion of disjuncture um, that centers the United States is different from um, from an acknowledgement of a disjuncture that would that would center China or a more multipolar Pacific, um, which is in fact I think what what we are in, right? Um, and you know I think that there, there's the rhetoric of of sort of the you know in 2009-11 when when Obama and Clinton are really sort of articulating that um, it's obviously continued and under its new formulation as the Indo-Pacific, right? Where we can see a deliberate sort of aim to sort of cultivate something multi multipolar that isn't China. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, uh, it, it remains the case. So I will just sort of say I, I, that whatever the disjunctures the 21st century bring, knowing the continuities um, of the 20th um, will, will help the United States and uh, other countries in the region really come, come to terms with, with that. Um, and then in, um, on just a couple of other things, one, I will say um, that I do really see um, what happens in the Philippines, particularly in the years after 1898, as fundamentally sort of in, um, wrapped up in the US experience in the West, right? And sort of in this war and conquest of native nations in the American West. And it is no accident um, that the Philippine scouts have the name that they do, right? It is, um, it is, um, it's modeled after the Indian scouts um, that the army maintained in the 19th century. Um, but it's also not the same thing, right? And in fact, is what the Philippine scouts are, in fact, more closely resemble um, the Spanish colonial army, the Guardia Civil, that the United States uh, took over from Spain um, in the years after 1898. So I actually kind of push back in some ways um, against people who've tried to read everything that happens in the Pacific or the Caribbean after 1898 as this sort of um, almost trans-historical thing called expansion, right? Um, and, you know, that can be best. And it's and if you study it from the center, it's you're going to see the center driving the story, right? But when you tell the history of 1898 from the Philippines, um, then, then, you know, you, you see some of the differences between that and, and the Caribbean. And I would... Love, you know, I would love to have done this project in the Caribbean as well and in the West, and, and then it would be that much um, longer. Um, I love your question. Um, uh, are Filipino Americans always bound by war? Um, you know, a good historian never says always, right? Um, so I guess the, the correct answer is no. Um, but I was really struck by, and, you know, I sort of you know, you came across this in the later chapters, right? The, the multi-generational nature of this and the way in which um, the broken promises of the Rescission Act um, are very meaningful for people who would themselves not benefit or, or even their own, you know, fathers or grandfathers would not have benefited from it. That it functions in many ways as a metaphor for for inequality, for discrimination, right? For exclusion or, or forms of second-class citizenship that uh, Filipinos who, who are not sort of tied to the US military um, might nevertheless um, find a powerful sort of explanation um, in, in the United States. So, so always no, but, um, but, but yes. And so, and tracing that in a broader range of, of people, right, um, who, whose work supports US foreign policy objectives without being uniform service, right? So like nurses or care workers, you know, sort of near the military, like foreign workers, um, you know, foreign Filipino workers, 
um, who go from the Philippines to places like Iraq as contract workers, you know, I think are a really important part of that story. Thank you very much. We're now gonna open this up for question, discussion, and answer. And for those of you who are watching and are interested in posing a question, you've got, as Christian said at the outset, a number of ways of doing so. You can use the raise hand function on Zoom. That way we can call on you. You unmute yourself and you can pose your question directly. You can use the Q&A function uh, on Zoom, which means I get to read your question. Or if you're on Facebook Live, um, uh, you can use uh, Rachel Wheatley's email address, which is in the chat, uh, and send the question in. Um, so I hope that is clear. Uh, I am going to call on for our first question, Cornelia Weiss. If you would unmute yourself, you can pose a question. And please introduce yourself before you start to uh, ask. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, my name's Cornelia Weiss. And Professor, thank you very much. Um, what was the motivation for your research? What drove your research? What aha moments did you have during your research? And what did you learn that you didn't anticipate that you would learn? Thank you very much. Uh, well, that's a, you know, that's a historian favorite question, right? And, and so we could be here for a long time. Um, I will say, um, I was, but I'll just say, briefly say, and thank you, Cornelia, for, for the question. Um, it's, uh, it's, what surprised me is, um, is, is how, fre how frequently I kept being surprised <laughs> in, um, in the archives. Right, um, and sort of where I would find um, sort of material and where and who I would find there. Right, um, you know, sort of like stumbling over, um, you know, sort of a name of that you might know from late 20th century history, who is serving in in the Philippines during the Second World War, um, that sort of thing. You know, sort of finding um, sort of political alliances um, in, in very sort of surprising ways along along the way. The motivation for me was really to try um, to connect. Uh, military history and the history of, of immigration um, and American politics. Um, that, you know, sort of my goal here is um, to break down an entirely arbitrary and, and unhelpful divide uh, between military history and, and other subfields um, that I think is particularly unhelpful for understanding the 20th century United States um, and the sort of the, the ways in which it shapes um, American life um, in, in so many ways. And that's sort of part of what I was trying to do. Um, and I think also to just sort of trace some of the ways that that war um, uh, can't be told only in the histories of, of the moments that, that the United States is at war, right? That it shapes peacetime uh, periods really powerfully as well. Thank you. Uh, Michael Goodman has his hand up, if he could unmute and introduce. Yes, hi, uh, my name's Mike Goodman. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm an alumnus of UW-Madison. Uh, I had two brief questions uh, regarding U.S.-Philippine relations. Uh, one is, is it true that Filipinos still have some kind of a preferred admissions or acceptance status to uh, any of the United States service academies? I understand there are is a Philippine quota for ad admissions uh, to those academies. My second question is, is it true that the Philippines were once uh, considered for possible statehood, but I guess it was uh, not seriously pursued because of the fact that, uh, because of the fact of the great distance that would have been involved, thanks. Um, sure thing. So I, I think um, the, on the first question, the, the short answer is no. Um, uh, well, but there's a little bit of a yes in there as well, right? That during the colonial period, um, that both the U.S. Military Academy and the U.S. Naval Academy um, sort of en enrolled um, students from the Philippines, um, many of whom became, you know, some of the earliest graduates of West Point and became some of the leading military, Filipino military officers of the post-war period, including, of course, most famously, uh, President Fidel Ramos, um, who was president uh, of, of the Philippines in the early 1990s. Um, though the, that policy, of course, ends with the end of colonialism in 1946, although, of course, foreign students do continue to enroll um, at, at the service academies um, as 
I, I could get the details wrong, but basically his special students or visiting students. Um, so that would be the, the policy that I think is, is uh, in place today. Um, and statehood was briefly um, considered, some advocated it. Um, the fact of the matter is that, that, that movements for independence um, were far more powerful um, uh, among Filipinos um, and that the agitation force for statehood and incorporation of the Philippines was never substantial um, in, in the US Congress in the early 20th century. Um, there's a brief re-debate of the question in the years right after the Second World War when the Philippines was so devastated um, infrastructurally, economically, um, uh, but even, even then that the sense that, that, this, that the Philippines would obtain sort of nominal independence, right? And sovereignty um, was much more of a priority, particularly uh, for President Truman, among others. Thank you. Herman Cohen has a hand up. If you would unmute, introduce, and pose a question. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm a, a retired foreign service officer. I specialize in Africa and therefore do not know too much about the Pacific. My question is, do the Filipino people feel that they are under a U.S. security umbrella? Um, well, thank you for that, that question. Um, I think uh, one of the nice things that I've been able to tap for the later chapters of the book is an organization in the Philippines called the Social Weather Survey. Um, which is uh, which is basically a poll national polling uh, sort of firm um, that that gives some pretty good insight into sort of public opinion um, in in the Philippines and and uh, part of, especially now much of its polling is done through social media um, uh, and can tap both Philippine and also uh, di diasporic uh, views. Um, but the answer to your question, um, I don't you know have a, a a polling results that I can give you off the top of my head. But what you have hit actually is the central question um, of the second half of the 20th century. Um, in the, what, I, what I came to see is the central question of Philippine foreign policy, which is, are we better off with the Americans or without them? Um, and in the book, I trace this through the kind of competing visions um, uh, in the Cold War era of two sort of leading figures, right? First, uh, General uh, Carlos Romulo, um, who is the primary advocate for saying we are better off with the Americans um, that, you know, own, own in an atomic world of, uh, you know, with, with Russia and China um, as, as enemies, that, that the Philippine sovereignty can only be defended um, under the American security umbrella. Um, and the challenge that comes to him from Lorenzo Tenyata, um, a longtime senator, an opponent of the base. Is, um, a critic who says that um, that we are only, we are far safer without the Americans here, right? That there would be no need to invade the Philippines, no need to bomb the Philippines um, uh, if if American bases and other presence was not there. What's interesting to me is I think that that fundamental question um, is still the fundamental question. Um, but instead of thinking about the Soviet Union or communist China uh, or the Japanese empire before that, um, that the question is really about, about, about the PRC today. Um, and and th those debates are, are intense and ongoing. Um, and you know, it was a question that I think in some ways Filipinos need to sort out for themselves. Part of what I traced so many times in this book is that at, right as that debate was happening among Filipinos in the Philippines, um, an American action would, would sort of distort the debate. Right, would sort of you know would, would push the debate in one direction um, or or another, usually closer to the United States, um, and so you know I sort of would want to encourage that that conversation to to continue um, in the twenty first century. James Ehrman has a hand up. If you would unmute and introduce. We're still on mute. I'm ready for you when you are. All right, we'll try again in a moment, but I'm gonna to turn to the question and answer um, uh, section uh, on Zoom. And we have a question from Brad Simpson, who says, hi, Chris. I'm teaching a class on the wars of 1898 and its many aftermaths for, a new history, for new history majors at the University of Connecticut. What would you say to students about the importance of treating 1898 to 1902 
as the start of a 123-year process that continued to deeply shape US and Filipino society. What does a long historical perspective about the Philippines give us for thinking about the US today? And he adds, some of those students are watching right now. All right. Um, well, thanks, Professor Simpson, for that that question um, and and for imposing this um, on on your students this afternoon. Um, so I think that the 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 the, the this the wars of eighteen ninety eight, um, which is is the phrase that historians use to identify sort of the multiple sort of conflicts um, involved that cannot be reduced solely to a war between the United States and Spain. Um, but a sort of, but the U.S. intervention into multiple national revolutions um, and and multiple conflicting empires um, does um, really sort of shed light on sort of a longer history of the United States in the world. Um, it is as as Professor Chang and I were sort of discussing. It's not a, a brand new moment, right? Um, that the United States had engaged in sort of territorial expansion in wars with native nations. Um, 1898 is not the beginning of American empire, and it's very important um, not to sort of see it as that. But it is also part of a history that continues to to this day. Um, and for me, I think what's most important um, is for uh, Americans to understand that this history is a very long one, um, because people in other parts of the world do understand that long history better than many Americans do. Um, and we could see this um, very uh, remarkably um, a few years ago um, when uh, President Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines was challenged um, for the human rights violations that accompany the drug war or so-called drug war in the Philippines. Um, and, and, and summoned in response, right, sort of images of, of US uh, sponsored military violence in the Southern Philippines from uh, 1906, a massacre at the mountaintop of Budaho. Um, and, and essentially said in so many words, you know, who, who are you to sort of criticize us? Um, showing that the, there is a long history um, of, of memories of US military action um, and participation um, that, that sort of matter, right? Um, to, to, uh, to places in the world in ways that many Americans um, don't have the, the, don't carry that burden of memory. Um, so that, that would be one, one short answer. We're going to try James Ehrman again. So if you could unmute, get that question in. Going once. Well, it's a very nice afternoon, so maybe he's gone for a walk. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. um, so can I ask um, Professor Chang to, an to answer that last question, right? Um, you know, sort of see if she has thoughts on uh, how, how 1898 might shape how we teach today, especially, you know, someone who works in both, both history and Asian American studies. Right? Um, honestly, I think your question was um, great. And I mean, your answer was great. And the question is, is, an, is a really important one, I think. Um, this is also where what you had said in terms of history is also a pattern of continuities is really important, right? And that 1898 marks um, a different form of kind of um, colonial takeover, right? Than what we have seen, but it isn't some kind of radical shift, right? That shaped everything. So I think what you said was great. Thank you. I'm gonna slip in a question of my own here. Uh, and you've, you've touched upon this you know, indirectly in a, a number of responses to the questions that we've had, but I would like you to focus more explicitly you know, on what we in the history biz you know, call the historiographical intervention. So America in the world is to the extent that we have boom fields, no one's hiring these days, but in general, there are a lot of people working on this. And American empire is a topic that has generated lots and lots of scholarship articles and books uh, in recent years. You've written a book um, with uh, uh, basic books for, for a popular readership. Uh, it's an eminently readable book. Um, so just, just as a, a piece of literature, um, it, is, it is just very readable and very compelling. If you could just for a few moments kind of step back and place yourself into the historiographical field of America in the world and the historians of American empire and tell us how you 
either reinforce some of the tenets of what these folks are saying or how you might challenge them. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and yes, I, this is, um, I appreciate the chance to sort of put in some of the historiographic um, paragraphs that, uh, that I probably took out from one of the, you know, from one of the drafts uh, along the way. Um, and in part, uh, what I am trying to do is participate, right, in this sort of generation long and sort of really quite wide attempt to shift the lens from um, the history of foreign relations narrowly construed, uh, or sorry, the history of foreign policy narrowly construed to the history of foreign relations um, in this broader sense, but to do it in a particular way. Um, and so, um, and this, as Professor Chang pointed out at the very beginning, right, um, my understanding of empire um, is, and here I'm really borrowing from the historian Paul Kramer, that is that not thinking of it as a thing or a moment, right, but as, as an analytic lens, right, what he calls thinking with the imperial, right, uh, that it is a series of social formations, some of which take the form of territorial empire, um, in a place like the Philippines, and some of which do not. And that's why I think actually studying this in the, in the Philippines and studying US-Philippine relations is particularly productive, right? Because there you, you can, you know, sort of older, um, you know, sort of much older formulations of formal and informal empire just don't really make sense, right, as distinctions, right? But imperial formations can be found um, across um, both the colony and, and the metropole. That's part of what I'm doing. A second sort of historiographic intervention that is that I'm trying to kind of bring the history of empire into, the his, into a different history of citizenship and military service, um, sort of building in many ways on the first book that I wrote um, on the First World War um, and a really enormous literature on the history of people of color and other uh, sort of minoritized groups or racialized groups who have used military service to make claims on citizenship uh, and national belonging. Um, and that is a deeply important history. It's also a deeply nationalist historiography that imagines citizenship as an unquestioned prize to be claimed by the disenfranchised in a quid pro quo through military service. Um, but when you look at colonial soldiers, um, whether US colonial soldiers or the colonial soldiers of Britain, France, the Netherlands, or many other empires, um, that citizenship is um, sort of not always the name of the prize, right? Um, even if it is the, the name of the form that they are filling out, right? I call this in the book, I call it strategic citizenship, right? As sort of an effort to kind of, uh, to, both, to both use citizenship as a formal category, while also sort of challenging the imposition of it um, um, as the sort of, as the political, uh, as sort of dictating what the political aspirations of Filipinos might be, right? And then the third um, sort of big historiographic intervention, and I traced this a little bit earlier, is um, to, uh, to write this book as a labor history of the US military, right? And there are several other scholars, really there's dozens of other people working on this, this project right now. And I'm really drawing on and participating with them um, in trying to kind of think about, um, about military forces uh, through the lens and analytics of, of labor history um, in ways that I think show us a great deal about, about the organization of work in the 20th century, um, as well as the organization of, of military force. Thank you. Paul here has his hand up. Uh, if Paul would unmute and pose a question. Message, there it is. Good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, I'm Paul Hare. I'm currently at the Center for the National Interest. I've always been intrigued. You've touched on this a little bit. Uh, I've always been intrigued that the, that the contrast between the historical experience uh, of the 1898 to 1919, you know, true period, very negative views of the United States that are the, partly the legacy of that. And then the, the, the dramatic difference between the contrast to the very positive views of the US that came out of World War II. Uh, and it's, you know, it's fluctuated since then, uh, a couple of generations or decades later, we had this negative association, I think in the minds of the Filipinos with the Marcos administration. My question is what is kind of the net, uh, balance sheet uh, in terms of Philippine historical memory and their views of the United States, particularly when you when you see the the, the kind of ambivalence that we've seen from uh, from President Duterte. Uh, are the Philippines generally 
generally more positive or more negative in terms of their historical perspective, of the United States at this point in our history. Um, well, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm actually looking uh, looking this up because I have it, um, and this is one of my favorite statistics. I think it uh, comes from a 2014 poll um, that was done by Pew, um, the research firm in, in the United States, um, which asked people all around the world, um, you know, how do you, you know, do you think positively or negatively about the United States? Um, and in 2014, 85% of Filipinos thought positively about the United States. Um, that's higher than the percentage of Americans who said that they think highly of the United States, right? Um, so that is certainly the case. And by contrast, right, um, only uh, in a different poll a couple of years later, um, only 27% of Filipinos agreed um, that, um, that, that uh, Philippine national interests and Chinese national interests um, were, were in alignment, right? Um, so you know, I think that, that it, using that statistic, um, you know, sort of shows, I think, that the, that the relations are, if you're looking for the balance sheet that you asked for, the balance sheet is on the positive side. Um, but I think it also reveals um, or, or demands that we scrutinize uh, sort of the ironies um, that are inherent in that, right? Um, and the ironies that run through the entire book, right? The, the book is written in a very, is, it's in an ironic mode. I'm interested in people um, who fought for the country that that colonized their country, right? Um, and you know there are uh, sort of there are critics of uh, of mindsets in the Philippines that that you know Filipinos who would say that this is a that that poll statistic is not necessarily an accurate depiction of of public opinion, but maybe a sign of lingering mindsets of neo-colonialism. Um, and I think that uh, you know we need to sort of to unpack that. And I think that that relationship with its former colony that the United States has with the Philippines is, is different um, from several other empires um, and, their, and their former colonies, even as other imperial powers are deeply wrapped up um, in, in the post-colonial histories of the countries um, that, they, that were decolonized. Vina Lanzona has a hand up. Please unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi, Chris. Um, hey. Hi. Congratulations on your new book. I'm really very excited to, to. I mean, I didn't. I know that we talked about it in the past, so I'm really um, very excited that you, you've published it now. And I've always been a great admirer of Chris and his transnational, you know, the transnational nature of his work and trying to, especially connect. Um, you know, um, diplomatic history with with Philippine American history and and also Philippine studies, right? So I'm I, I'm asking a question as a Philippine historian of obviously um, you know working on Philippine studies. And by the way, I'm a, also a, I teach it I teach Philippine history at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So I was very very excited about the questions and comments of Professor Chang. And I think I, I wanted to just ask about, and I think it's probably related to the question before this question about, you know, about Filipinos, right? And how Philippine scholars especially would look at your work or interpret your work, you know? Um, and I think there's always this kind of ambivalence of Philippine scholars like myself, and especially those in the Philippines about, you know, how we look at, you know, Filip Filipinos in the US military, right? You know, um, while, while most everyone acknowledged the injustice done to these veterans, especially in the denial of the benefits that were promised to them, but then also, you know, as, as what uh, Professor Cheng was talking about, that they've also been seen as both, of course, the subjects and agents of empire. Right. So this, so and that the fact that many of these Filipinos were fighting for the wars of the U.S. against countries like the Philippines, right? You know, in Vietnam and all that. So, so I feel like in Philippine studies in general that they don't put as much attention to the the U.S. military veterans. You know, um, especially when understanding the U.S. empire. And you know, it's it's different when you think about, of course, in Philippine studies, we've always talked about U.S. collaboration, Philippine elite collaboration, right? But of course, there's also collaboration in the military, but it doesn't have the same type of treatment or attention given by Philippine scholars. So I just wanted to ask, you know, your comments or opinion about that. Thank you. Uh, 
All right. Well, thank you, Professor Lanzona, and, uh, and thanks for coming too. Um, so uh, the I think um, I'll say just a couple of things. Right. Um, first, I think that the ironies abound in many ways, which is that um, that if you especially in sort of how I spoke about it today, Filipino soldiers and sailors in the US Armed Forces are in some of the sort of um, structurally least powerful, least agential positions. Um, they suffer uh, discrimination, they are paid less, they you know, have fewer rights, um, they, uh, their ability to sort of rise in the ranks is um, you know, sort of limited. Um, and so they may seem sort of powerless, um, uh, and they do some of the military's sort of dirtiest work in the 20th century. But yet, by by contrast, right, these are very good jobs, right? Um, these are very attractive positions um, for many people in the Philippines who you know who aspire to to these positions, um, who require certain amounts of social capital and, and, and language skills and connections in order to get these sort of bottom rung positions in the US armed forces, right? So the sort of the stark inequalities um, really sort of come out in that. And I think um, uh, it, it sort of makes us sort of, uh, makes us see the, the relationship of Filipino soldiers and sailors um, in, relation to the US armed forces, um, sort of in a, a, a kind of multi-vocal, multi-level sort of way. I chose not to use the word collaboration um, in the book. Um, uh, and I, I thought a lot about it. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it sort of fits with, um, with how we understand that um, uh, structurally. Um, there is, uh, there is cooperation, right? There is sort of a co-constitution um, of both Fil Filipino national subjectivity and US foreign policy. And that's part of what I'm getting at with this notion of, of being bound up, right? Bound by war. Um, but, um, but I wouldn't object to, to calling this collaboration either. Um, but I just also worried that if I, if I did that, it might um, sort of, it might distract or explain less than it needed to. Um, but I think um, you know it's absolutely true that that these um, figures are more Filipino veterans are much more studied in Filipino American um, and U.S. military history than they are in in Philippine studies. Thank you, Amanda Moore. Your hand is up. Unmute. Pose a question. Uh, yes, Mike. I have actually was had the pleasure of traveling to the Philippines with uh, my parents in the 1970s. And I was intrigued when somebody mentioned China. And in terms of present day, has China ever offered to the Philippines money for infrastructure? Um, yes, yes, definitely. And you know, there, the, there are sort of various partnerships that have been offered, some that have in fact actually been um, sort of explored, including um, sort of a, a kind of a public um, sort of bi a bilateral partnership for reconstruction, particularly around the Subic Bay um, Freeport Zone, which used to be the Subic Bay Naval Station. Um, these are both, and of course, today, sort of in the in 2021, um, sort of issues around vaccine distribution um, and public health uh, support for for responding to the coronavirus. Um, these are, you know, sort of contentious um, and political sort of issues um, in both, you know, in for both the Philippines and China. Um, I think that, you know, the, the Philippines trades more broadly um, throughout, uh, throughout Asia um, than it did in the 20th century. Um, you know, and sort of the book, my book doesn't really address issues of, of trade and economics um, to the extent that I, I wish it could, um, but, um, you know, it tells, I think a similar story could be told that way. Um, and I think that you would start to see some some real disjunctions in the 20th century around around trade in ways that um, you know just as you do with migration, right? That that in the early 20th century, one of the only places that Filipinos migrated was to the United States. By the late 20th century, Filipino migrations are global, right? And so that you know sort of multinational uh, trade in Asia. Um, uh, that creates ties with China, there's also a multi, multinational migration around the world as well. Thank you. 
Um, we have a question uh, from uh, Carolina um, uh, Maestrom, um, and this is going to tie into something I think that Christian wants to ask about in a second. Uh, and she writes, just wondering what were your favorite archives to research for this book? She thanks you for a great talk, and she greets you from the National Portrait Gallery. But Christian, I think you have a question that builds on the source base. Right. Now, it's basically the same question. I'm given your, I mean, it's I'm interested in in your uh, your sources, especially out of what you said about broadening uh, the history of diplomatic history beyond the history of foreign policy to uh, the history of, of foreign relations. Could you talk a little bit about how you went beyond the sort of traditional diplomatic sources in your book? Um, no, thank you both um, for those questions. And um, uh, the the short answer is that you. Um, you will be struck um, by the power, um, by the inequalities of empire the minute you walk into the archives to do a project like this. Uh, that, the, that, the, that especially for the pre-1945 period, uh, Philippine history is far better documented and preserved in the United States than it is in the Philippines. That is a legacy of colonialism. Um, and, and the destruction of the war and also the power of, of the metropole to, to do the, the storytelling um, and to record the archives. Um, so I knew, I think I knew from the start that I wasn't going to find what I was looking for um, in government archives, either of the United States or the Philippines. Um, although I, I you know, scrounged every corner I could. Um, but I also, you know, I was trained as a U.S. historian, and U.S. historians are spoiled um, by because they're drowning in sources. And you know, I, I um, you know, I, a very distinguished um, social historian of the United States asked me if I was using the letters and diaries of of the soldiers, and I had to point out that um, most of, you know, the only the only markings they left in in the archives were their fingerprints, right, on on a payroll, um, and so it was going to be a real challenge. Um, what I like to tell people is that I set out in this book to, to construct a Pacific archive in order to tell a Pacific history, right? Um, because that Pacific archive doesn't exist in, it doesn't exist in one place, right? That it has to be constructed, right? And back to Professor Arneson's sort of question about historiographic interventions, this is something I'm trying to do for Pacific studies as an enterprise, right? And as sort of that's happening right now, a lot of which is being done in very important kind of theoretical ways, right? Sort of using new theoretical cross-disciplinary approaches to think about the Pacific. I'm really trying to kind of assemble um, a Pacific archive and sort of see what that can do um, to sort of generate new histories. Um, but on a more sort of uh, less abstract level, I would say one of my favorite places and the place to which I'm enormously indebted um, is the Filipino American National Historical Society. It's based in Seattle, Washington, um, organized by Dorothy Cordova and the late Fred Cordova, um, which among other things did dozens and dozens of oral history in the 1970s uh, that I, with people who I would otherwise never have been able um, to, to recapture their stories. Um, so that's a really important organization for me. Thank you. James Ehrman, has written us a question. Uh, he was having difficulty with the muting function. Uh, he says, you refer to America's broken promise, 1946, the Rescission Act, but this wasn't nearly as grave a broken promise as that of putting down Philippine independence, which dates not from July 4th, 1946, but 1898. America extinguished this independence with great brutality. During my three years in the Philippines, 1993 to 1996, I never saw references to the Philippine insurrection, but only the Philippine American war. Um, yes, thank you, James, um, for that. Um, and it, it is true, right, um, that the, the Rescission Act is um, uh, one of many broken promises, right? Um, uh, broken promises. Um, and so part of it is the denial of independence, right, which was first. Uh, declared on June 12th, 1898, right, by the Philippine Revolutionary uh, Army, the first Republic in Asia, um, sort of not waiting for the United States and Spain to, to sort of hammer out the Treaty of Paris, um, but sort of by Filipinos sort of declaring their own independence, um, which was then sort of uh, suppressed, right, by, in the Philippine-American War. Uh, and, but very soon thereafter, um, the United States started making promises, right, um, promises of independence. 
um, and uh, particularly sort of, you know, uh, uh, most notably in the Jones Act of 1916, um, in, in which the United States promised independence to the Philippines at some later date, right, when a, a stable government could be established therein. Um, in 1934, with the Tidings McDuffie Act, which sort of uh, essentially sort of announced a, de a decolonization plan, but essentially promises independence, once again, at some future date. Right, um, a date that was imagined to be 10 years in the future was eventually extended out to July 4th, 1946. Um, but, it, but again, um, notice that the US, the formal transfer of sovereignty um, took place on July 4th, 1946, a, a significant day in the calendar for Americans, um, which was initially also Independence Day for uh, the Philippines um, until the early 1960s, 1962, I think, and when under uh, President Chostado Macabagal, uh, the, the date was changed to June 12th, right? The date at which Filipinos did in fact actually declare their own independence, right? And sort of re remake those terms of independence and, and promise making. Thank you. Lawrence Heilman has a hand up. Please unmute and pose a question. There. Yes. I'm unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon. A very exciting and very important book. Uh, I'm just delighted that I got back from a previous appointment to hear this excellent presentation. My question, well, first a little bit of background. Um, I've had two family members who played heroic roles uh, in the Philippines in the wars. One uh, during the 1884 uh, part, a honor, uh, a uh, honor Medal of Honor winner, and one in the World War II as a Navy officer uh, going up and down the coast of. So there's family involvement. In terms of my particular involvement, I uh, am presently at the Smithsonian in the Anthropology Department, but I had a long career with USAID, and on several occasions went to the Philippines to take a look at AIDS program there. My question is this. There was a long program starting in the early 50s, right down to the time uh, it was finally uh, signed off. I forget when that was, but uh, it was a, by aid standards, one of its largest programs, and it operated in almost every sector imaginable, agriculture, education, health, environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering, did you pick up any sort of feeling what the, fellow, the Filipinos felt about this US government aid program that ran at least for 40 years, uh, a lot of money, a lot of money, and how it is perceived. I guess that's my question. Looking forward to your answer. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I may have to disappoint you, um, Lawrence. Um, so uh, this is a bit out. I tended not to look at um, sort of questions of development and, and foreign aid in part because um, it often ran separately from, from military undertakings, um, and also because so many, many other scholars um, have sort of really taken this up um, uh, in, in my field in the last few years. I would point um, to a few, um, and Professor uh, Lanzona, who spoke earlier, um, I'm sure could, could add a few names as well. Um, Professor Nick Cullither, who's written about development issues, um, Teresa Ventura, um, Diana Martinez, um, several other scholars um, in the United States and the Philippines. Um, who have really kind of scrutinized and, and examined this history. Um, one thing, um, you know, I, it, it is certainly the case that the, the, the existing connections between the United States and the Philippines um, and the kind of the, made it possible for the United States to try out many of its other Cold War initiatives in the Philippines first. Um, and I would imagine that's the case for USAID. I know that's the case for the Peace Corps, right? When some of the very first Peace Corps volunteers go to the Philippines, in part because there is already a kind of a longstanding um, infrastructure that you know makes it possible for Americans to to visit. And um, and so I, I you know I would love for someone to write the the history that you're you're asking for. I would I would love to read it too. Thank you. There are many questions still in the Q&A, but I have the unfortunate task of drawing this to a close since we're now at 5.30. So I just want to say thank you to all of you uh, in the audience, those who asked questions, uh, and certainly to Cindy Yifeng Cheng and Christopher Capazola, and of course, 
Christian Osterman, my appreciation. Christian, back to you. Thanks, Eric. Let me remind everyone that we will meet again next week on April 5, featuring a discussion with Amanda Frost on a presentation on You Are Not a Citizen, Citizen Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. That's next week, April 5th. Thanks again to Chris, Cindy, Eric for a terrific discussion. Thank you to our audience again for watching, participating. We're adjourned. Stay safe and good night. <laughs>